Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, known as the Sunday of Joy. Today we have lit the candles, and I thank you for coming to do that as a family. And as we've lit this rose candle, the pink candle, it's symbolic of the transition that happens from repentance to joy in Christ's birth. Just days away at this point. The baby is almost here, and you can hear the toes tapping. Delivering mothers don't have tapping toes. They're just ready. First-time fathers are beside themselves, and grandparents are knocking at the door and standing at the window day and night without any boundaries whatsoever. <laughs> and in our Advent waiting for Jesus, we feel in our bones that salvation is at hand. Joy is alive in all of the texts that we have in the scripture today. We didn't hear from Zechariah or Isaiah. We heard that at 9. But in Zechariah 3 and Isaiah 12 and Philippians 4 and Luke 3, there's a consistent theme of joy over what God has done and what God will do. It is a joy that is anchored in God's love and presence in human life and reality. This joy takes seriously the distance between God's hope for human life on the one hand and the realities that life as it is actually lived on the other hand is tough at times and it makes room for this joy in wonderful ways even in spite of all the challenges of life. It is a joy that is all the more intense because it is kindled amid circumstances in which joy is least expected. In the prophecy of Zephaniah, some of the most despairing passages of Hebrew scripture roll out from the prophet. Following the reign of evil King Manasseh, who ruled for 45 years on the throne over 2,800 years ago, the conditions of life are depressing. Through his lies, his deceit, his destruction of people, his murder of his enemies, the narcissistic Manasseh left his nation in ruins. Addressing these conditions, the prophet sounds depressed most of the time, to be honest. And then all of a sudden, without any warning, he just blurts out and declares. And Mark, I was thinking of this as I was listening to you sing. It's just out of nowhere. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, he says. It literally comes out of the blue. The reason for this new exaltation is simple. God is in your midst, he says. And because God is in the midst of all of us, the clouds break and the day shines. And then Isaiah 12 serves as the psalm of the day today. It too is a song of joy. After 11 chapters of oracles that have been directed face on, to the people of Jerusalem, again crying out about their waywardness, the prophet all of a sudden out of nowhere turns to joy. This joy compels faith and trust as people wait for and receive the gracious and loving outpouring of God's mercy. Waiting for salvation's arrival requires faith and trust. It requires strength and might. It requires conviction and hope. God's salvation is at hand, and Isaiah sings from his heart of pure joy. You see the pattern here? Joy doesn't come out of happiness that preceded it just seconds before. Joy comes out of pain. It comes out of despair. It comes out of the tough things of our lives. Philippians 4 continues the joy fest. The presence of God in the coming of Jesus Christ reorients all of life of every believer because we are men and women of faith, we have reason to rejoice, period. Here we are called to live gently, to stop worrying about everything. And I'm going to repeat that sort of like cleaning your room. To stop worrying about everything and instead give thanks to God. And finally, 
These wonderful words that stay with us throughout time. We've heard them in so many other contexts, but here they are in their original delivery source. Let the peace that passes human understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. While this may sound very simplistic, it is grounded in a strong belief that the Lord is near. It is ever true that this dose of joy that Philippians brings us, actually an entire letter of joy, continues to bring us back to this ground of understanding that the joy of our lives comes from the nearness of God. By the time we arrive at our fourth text this morning, Luke 3, we are dancing with joy and all of a sudden the brakes get put on because joy meets fire. The fire line is drawn by John the Baptist. He looks out at his congregation and I'm almost afraid to make eye contact with what I'm about to say next because you know it's coming. He looks out at his congregation. They've all come from everywhere to gather at the Jordan River and he yells, you brood of vipers. I'm looking up there where no one's sitting. That's quite a way to begin a sermon, don't you think? Especially when everybody's tried so hard to get back. Sort of like coming back from a pandemic. The first thing you hear back in the room is, you brood of vipers. It's enough to scare you, really. I think so. And everyone in the congregation thinks he's speaking to everyone else. Right? <laughs> so, it must be the tax collectors who they noticed were over there on the side. It had to be the soldiers. It, it, it couldn't have been us. We're just fishermen. We're not going to hurt anybody. We're not a brood of vipers. But you know what? John doesn't actually identify who the brood of vipers are. He never says who they are. So we can only assume that everyone in the congregation is a brood of vipers. It's not just a few snakes in the grass. Anyway, you can see where joy has sort of taken a beating here. While some may find it rude for the preacher to call a congregation a brood of vipers, John doesn't care. He doesn't care about rude. After all, he dresses in camel hair. He eats locusts and wild honey for his sustenance and for his nutrition. And he lives alone in the desert. He doesn't need friends, and he's not interested in making any new ones. He has come as a prophet to declare the promises of God to the people of God. He has come to say that the Savior is at hand. The light of the nations is soon to arrive. And like the prophets Zechariah and Isaiah and Paul, John's focus is on justice and compassion and honesty. He is interested in helping people escape the wrath of God that is coming unless they reorder their lives and get their collective and individual acts back together. This passage turns on one question that keeps coming up from every group that's in the brood. The poor, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. They ask the same question. It's a question that comes from them in a very deep way. They're very concerned about this question. It is this, simply this. What should we do? What should we do? So John answers. First he says, I need you to feed the hungry. And I need you to clothe the naked. John knows, and we know too, that God created the world with enough resources for everybody. We end up with poverty because people with power and wealth want more, and they become greedy with that more, and the balance gets tossed on its head, and the poor suffer in the face of true imbalances. Greed destroys joy. It destroys balance in life and creates a world like, well, like one that we're facing today. And let me tell you, you don't have to look far to answer the question, what should we do? It's right outside our door, literally. Where two or three or four men huddle every night on the front steps of First Congregational Church here in downtown Columbus, and they're just trying to survive the cold with thin blankets while sleeping on stone. 
They work. All of them are working, but they don't have homes. They feel safe here under the archway of our beautiful cathedral, but they are now, as the weather turns, literally freezing to death and have no place to keep warm. This week, I received a call from Pastor Benjamin Morris and his wife, Pamela, who come to the street every night, come to our steps every night to feed and care for the men who are sleeping there. They've been doing this for almost a year, and I had no idea they were doing it. In his sweet, loving, kind, direct way, Pastor Morris, from his heart for Jesus Christ, asked me, what are we doing? And what would Jesus do if he saw men sleeping on the steps of the temple? He wanted to know. I was embarrassed, humbled, ashamed by the question that Pamela and Benjamin were asking. I have no good answer. I've done a few things myself, but not enough. I need an answer. We need an answer because no answer is not good enough, right? So what should we do? We should figure out something to do. We should figure out a way to care for them. And Pastor Morris has said to me, I'll help your church with this. Wow. So we need to help the men who are trying to survive outside our doors each night. Before, in the months before, it was rough for them. Now, it's becoming inhumane for them. So how can we care for Ray and Tony and the others that are there? Beyond the poor, John asks more questions, is asked more questions. John is asked questions by the tax collectors. What should we do? And he answers, don't do any more than the Romans force you to do. He tells the tax collectors to join the resistance to Rome. He doesn't tell them to stop collecting taxes. He simply says to them, do the bare minimum. In labor management circles, this is called work to rule. Do exactly what is written down in the rules and not a thing more. Now we all know that when you work to rule, the world and the empire will grind to a halt in a hurry under such circumstances. It's not gonna last long if all of us do what was written in our job description and nothing more. Don't I get an amen for that? <laughs> the soldiers have come as well. The soldiers have come to John and they're wanting to know what they should do. They say, what should we do? And John answers this amazing answer. Do not use your weapons and your power to injure or, or hurt people or damage them in any way. He doesn't tell the soldiers not to be soldiers. He tells them to be kind to human beings because they have the power of the empire in their grasp. He wants leaders with weapons not to use weapons against people. The joy of the gospel, the call to follow Jesus with joyful hearts should lead us to all find answers to the questions, what should we do when we encounter them under John's guidance here? John's answers are simple. He says, feed the hungry, provide clothing and protection for those who are naked and underclothed. Don't hurt people economically by extorting them in whatever ways you are able. And don't hurt people physically by treating them less than human. Joy comes when justice and compassion and honesty join together. Joy is a choice. Henry Nouwen once wrote, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and we have to keep choosing it every day. What should we do as we ask the questions of what we look at and what we can do? The answer is simply this, choose joy and it will guide you to do the right thing. Or in the words of Joseph Campbell, find a place inside where there is joy and the joy will burn away the pain. And that is the place where fire and joy meet. Amen.